welcome back to my world of stuff. My name is Paul Mount. If you've just stumbled across this video, if you watch it and you quite like it, why not like and subscribe? Um, subscribe press that subscribe button, uh, thumbs up, like, and you'll be notified of all upcoming new videos. Thank you very much. Right, let's talk Marvel. Um, I wanted to do a little video about the MCU because it's a hot topic at the moment. It's always been a fairly hot topic. I suppose people always have polarised views about the whole idea of this superhero franchise that, let's face it, has been dominating the box office pretty much since Iron Man in 2008. And Marvel has rolled along developing this shared cinematic universe with different films, different characters, crossovers, spin-offs. It's become absolutely huge in the last 14 years from the little acorn of that first Iron Man film, which nobody expected much from. So what we now have is this is this behemoth of, uh, of, a, of a titanic film franchise that seems unstoppable. Or does it? There's been a lot of talk in the last few weeks about Phase 4, about how Phase 4, which started with WandaVision beginning of last year, hasn't lived up to the... Um, the hype and hasn't lived up to the high standards set by the first three Marvel phases. Um, and at the Comic-Con in San Diego last week, week before last, Kevin Feige, the big boss of Marvel, announced uh, the majority of the titles from phase five and a couple of titles from phase six. This has sent a lot of people into a bit of a tiz and a bit of a frenzy one way or another. And what I wanted to do is just talk for a few minutes in a non-hysterical fashion about my view of Marvel, where it stands at the moment, where it's going, where it could go, where I think it might go, where I'd like it to go. There's a lot of stuff out there online. You'll see it on YouTube. There's a lot of people who are histrionic and hysterical and overreacting. and They can't talk in terms of, well, this has been disappointing or this isn't as good as it should be or I didn't like this. It's got to be this overreaction. This is crap. This is terrible. This is, you know... But this is what happens with a lot of um, amateur critics, if you like. Uh, I'm not calling myself anything other than that. But I think fanboys have a different way of expressing things, perhaps, than people who might take a step back and, and think about things rather than just pouring out vitriol and hatred and ill-considered opinions. But then that's what a lot of YouTube and the internet is all about. It's about giving people the chance to express themselves however poorly in many cases. But I wanted to step away from that, really, and try and put all that aside, because there's a lot of nonsense being spouted by fans and laps fans and people who who are, tire, are tiring of these things. And I can understand people might be getting a little bit tired of Marvel, because it's been around for 14 years, and it's done a, it, it put out a lot of product. And there's a lot more to come, which is sort of the point of this video, in a way, to talk about where I think Marvel's going, and as I said, what what I'm hoping to get from it, because I, you know, I'm a, an avowed fan of Marvel Cinematic Universe. I I read the comics when I was a kid, uh, and I started reading some of them again now as an adult because the films have piqued my interest in these comics. And of course, I like the early comics. I'm not really a fan of modern comics, the the try hard comics that we get these days. Um, I like the old fashioned naivety of the old Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, Roy Thomas, that sort of you know, slightly lurid, penny dreadful type style of writing. Even I find it quite charming. Um, and it's been fantastic to see these characters that I read in the 70s, um, the 60s and 70s, coming to life. Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, The Avengers, Spider-Man. I used to read all these things and never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined seeing them on the screen. Certainly not in the in this way with this sort of spectacle and budget and, and this sort of success because they have become the 21st century cultural phenomenon. Um, it seems unstoppable, but nothing's unstoppable. Everything has its day in the sun. Things fade. Fads, if you want to call it a fad, fads run out of steam. People's tastes change and we move on. Is that going to happen to Marvel and superhero films? I don't know. Um, but I just wanted to look back at what we've had in Phase 4 and just give my opinion of it. And what I think we can take from what we know of Phase 5 and Phase 6. I've got a little list here, which I printed out this morning, just to remind myself of what we've had in Phase 4. Now, I think the first point to be made, really, about Phase 4, which, as we know now, ends in uh, 
November with uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. It's, it's been a hell of a lot in phase four. The earlier phases were sort of three or four films, five films, and they all built towards something. They all, the first phase built towards the Avengers. It was establishing the characters. Wham! Then we went into the Avengers. Uh, phase two then was sort of developing towards the Age of Ultron. And phase three, of course, took us towards the Thanos saga and Infinity War and Endgame, like this huge spectacle, which really brought together everything we'd seen in those films over the years in this huge, you know, cosmic tale of death and destruction, a time travel, death and then reinvention. Um, phase four, and I would agree, a lot of people said phase four seems a bit scrappier. It doesn't have that sense of heading towards something of a of a massive sort of ah that's bring it all together there's this vague stuff about the multiverse which has been introduced into some of the titles that we've had not a big fan of the multiverse thing myself because it makes everything a bit too unreal i mean i think if you're talking about superheroes you're talking about a certain level of unreality anyway but when you're then talking about endless opportunities for multiverses and different versions of the same characters for me it's a bit distancing it's a bit I don't, you know, I don't really care. And I understand that I accept a lot of people have said that it takes the stakes away because Iron Man may be dead in our world, but he might be alive in another multiverse so he can be brought back. And this is possibly a way around one of the dilemmas Marvel has. I think it does miss having the likes of Robert Downey Jr. and uh, Chris Evans as Captain America because they were two such strong figureheads of the MCU and now they're gone. There is a sense of drift slightly. It's sort of... You know, there's nobody in control of the whole thing. Uh, so that would be a way to bring those characters back if that was to happen, if the actors wanted to do it. You've got the multiverse option. Oh, look, we brought in Iron Man from World 574 or whatever it is. So I'm not a big fan of the multiverse thing because it's it's a bit too much. It's a bit too science fiction. If you think. And I think for a, an audience, the public have rushed to see these films. And I think that perhaps you're taking them on a journey a bit too far imaginatively because it's... It's it's just too extreme, but that's just my own personal thing. So if there has been any sort of direction to phase four, it has been with the introduction of the multiverse and and the opportunities that that offers for storytelling. We had in phase four, we will have had by the time it ends, we'll have had 10 TV projects and seven feature films. That's 17 separate projects that have been released since the beginning of 2011. Now, bearing in mind, a lot of this stuff was made during the pandemic. That in itself is a hell of an achievement. And I think, to be fair, you can't really tell a lot of it has made the pandemic. It's been beautifully put together. But is it too much? If you look at the stuff we've had, I think in terms of the films, um, and to be fair, I think Marvel are to be congratulated for pushing out with some new characters and introducing very remote corners of the Marvel comic universe into the film universe, but it does, I'm not going to say barrel scraping because that's going a bit too far, but it does give the slight impression that Marvel are aware they don't have the big hitters and they're sort of digging around for more obscure characters to bring to the screen. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that because historically Marvel have got so many characters. Um, Iron Man was an obscure character. There's no reason why, for example, Shang-Chi couldn't become the new Iron Man at some point because that's the way these things work. Characters catch on or they don't. So in terms of films, we've, we've had a mixed bag of films, I'll have to say, looking at the seven or six films we've had so far and the one to come. The first release came out last summer, of course, was Black Widow. Now, this is not one. I enjoyed Black Widow. I thought it was a great film. It was nice to see Scarlett Johansson again. I thought Florence Pugh was a real find as her sister. And, of course, we've seen her since in Hawkeye. David Harbour was great as her father, and of course Rachel Weisz as mother, or the adopted parents. And it did provide some interesting backstory into how Black Widow became the woman that she was. But of course there's no getting away from the fact that that was a sort of a, a film that should have come out ten years earlier. Black Widow, as we know, died in Avengers Endgame, and this sort of seemed a bit, oh by the way, uh, a bit perfunctory and a bit sort of, a bit late. But much as I enjoyed it, I really thought it was a good film. Um, it just seemed a bit of a afterthought in a way, a bit of a, a late addition to the run. But I generally enjoyed it. That was followed up late summer by Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. This introduced the character of Shang-Chi, obviously the martial arts expert, who came about 
in the 70s in the wake of the Kung Fu craze when uh, Bruce Lee became a phenomenon back in the mid-1972-73. Well, Marvel jumped on the bandwagon, if you like, and created a couple of Kung Fu characters. There was uh, Shang-Chi and Iron Fist, who was less successfully brought to life in the Netflix TV series. Um, Shang-Chi was a good film. I enjoyed Shang-Chi. Um, I liked the first half more than the second half. I liked all the grounded stuff um, in uh, in New York, where Shang-Chi's working as a car valet. And I liked all the, the gritty sort of rural, you know, modern urban stuff um when it went off into the sort of the fantasy element with this hidden kingdom with the cgi dragons and things it was great and i enjoyed it but it seemed like two different films jammed together and i have to say i enjoyed the first half more than the second half which i agree sort of became fairly typical marvel cgi overload at the end but all in all a very good film then for me uh, towards the end of the year we had marvel's first massive misfire for me was eternals um, now, I'd read the comics, the, Jack, the original run of Jack Kirby comics. I bought two omnibus editions of those. Didn't really know much about the Eternals. I'd heard of them, but I didn't know much about them. So I thought it would be interesting to read the comics, just so I was familiar with the characters. I needn't have bothered, really, because the film paid just lip service to the original comics. Um, the comics are so massive and so extraordinary and so over-the-top uh, conceptually that when I was reading them, I thought, well, this, isn't, you know, this can't be reflected in the film. They can't do this. And, of course, they didn't. It was very much a watered-down version of the Eternals that we saw. Uh, one example that I often give is that in the original comic strip, the Eternals, um, there, there's three races on the earth. There's the Eternals, there's the humans, and there's the Deviants. And the Deviants are an intelligent, wily uh, race of humanoid creatures. Um, in the film, they're just beasts, uh, which is just cannon fodder. Um, and the Eternals were just dull. It was a dull film. I mean, I sat I went to see it with my friend Scott and I think he would have happily left halfway through. He was sighing and exasperated because you had an action scene, there long scenes of people talking on beautiful locations or on cliff tops or looking up at mountains, just talking. It was just dull. It was just, you know, the whole concept of the Eternals needed to be what it was in the comics. And I think this was just boiled down into something very generic. And I know it was directed by Chloe Zhao, so a lot was expected of it. I think she tried to bring an art house sensibility to it, but in doing so, lost the comic strip sensibility. And for me, Eternals is the first Marvel fail. And I've no interest in watching the film again. I bought it on HD for the sake of completion on 4K rather, but I can't see me thinking, oh, I'll watch Eternals again, because it was such a stultifying experience in the cinema. I had no desire to revisit it. Then we had the real triumph of Phase 4, which was uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, which, of course, went on to be this massive blockbuster with well over a billion dollars uh, at the box office worldwide. And, of course, a lot of people have said it wasn't even a Marvel film. It was a Sony film uh, with Marvel involved. And that, that, that is true. There's no getting away from the fact that um, Sony had the license to Spider-Man. They've allowed Marvel to make these three very good films directed by John Watts. This was the culmination, of course, and it was just joyous. I've seen it several times now, of course. You know, spoilers, we've got all the other Spider-Men are back, lots of the villains are back. It's a real fan piece. But it works beautifully because it's a good story and there is an emotional heart to it. There are certain things that happen that will change Spider-Man forever. And I hope that Sony and Marvel can come to some, to sort, some sort of agreement because I really want to see more of Tom Holland as Spider-Man because he captures the essence of that Peter Parker Spider-Man Think so well. It'll be interesting now that he is Spider Man rather than the sort of augmented Spider Man that we've seen before. He's now just, as we saw at the end of the film, he's just Peter Parker, teenager with a costume and superpowers. And it'll be interesting to see perhaps the comics reflected a little bit more than they have been in the films. Um, then we had early this year, back in May, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Again, I really enjoyed this. I thought this was great fun. I've watched this about three times, saw it in the cinema, watched it since a couple of times. Um, yeah, it was directed by Sam Raimi. It brings a lot of his horror sensibilities to it. There is a video further back where I talk about the film. Um, I, I know a lot of people said that it doesn't explore the multiverse in the way that something like Everything Everywhere All at Once does. They're different films. I think it's silly to compare them. And a lot of people have. This is a superhero film. This deals with the multiverse in the way it needs to to tell this story. Uh, and I think it was very good. I thought it wrapped up the Scarlet Witch saga very well. Um, 
Benedict Cumberbatch is Doctor Strange. I mean, he's just nailed that character now, and it's and I really look forward to seeing where they go with him. Um, so I really enjoyed, enjoyed Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Then most recently we've had Thor, Love and Thunder. This is very divisive. This is the follow-up to Ragnarok from, what, 2017? I didn't enjoy Ragnarok. I must admit, I don't like what they've done with Thor. As one of the original Avengers, he's now pretty much unrecognisable from the Thor we met back in Kenneth Branagh's original film, which I watched a couple of months ago, and he's such a good film. Thor has now become a bit of an oaf. You know, he's a man-child. Um... And I understand from Chris Hemsworth's point of view, it's it's probably fun to play it that way. And of course, Taita Waitiki has brought this comedy vibe to it, which really annoyed me in the first one. I wasn't really expecting it. I, I didn't expect Thor to become that stupid that quickly. I went into Love and Thunder and I was, obviously my mind was ready for it. So even though it is it is infantile and the humour remains much the same, I didn't find it as irritating because I was expecting it this time. And this time I did like the two driving dramatic stories, which was Jane Foster and her own private battles. And I like Gorb the God Butcher, played by Christian Bale. Now, again, I read part of the comic, the original Gore comic strip, so I knew a bit about that character. And, of course, it was portrayed in the film because you don't get to see enough of him. He's a God Butcher, but you don't see him butchering many gods. So he, he doesn't appear to be the threat which he could be if they just had a few more scenes of him killing people, basically. But it was a film that I, I sort of enjoyed it, really. Um, it's not Again, it's not one I will fly back to see, really. But if I was forced to watch it, I would watch it. I wouldn't necessarily want to watch Ragnarok again. Although I probably should give another chance. But all in all, I sort of I had a fairly good time with it. Some of the humour did exasperate me. I was sighing and rolling my eyes, especially the stuff with Zeus, played by Russell Crowe, by way of Harry Enfield Stavros. Ladies! Gentlemen! Fellow followers of my political persuasion. What's it, peeps? Um, but I was invested enough in part of the story to let that pass me by, as it were. And we've got to come Black Panther Wakanda Forever, which comes out in November. This is interesting because, of course, it's we've lost Chadwick Boseman, who's so brilliant as Black Panther, and this carries his legacy on with Wakanda with presumably a new Black Panther arriving at the end of the film. I don't know. It looks great. The trailer looks really good. And I suspect it'll be a good film. In terms of the TV, I'll just rush through these fairly quickly because I want to go on to the future rather than dwell on the past. Uh, WandaVision was terrific. I mean, that was that was something very different. And I know a lot of people who weren't necessarily big Marvel fans really invested in this because of the way it played with this idea of all these sitcom tropes. Every episode was a different sitcom. And, the re and as we got closer to the end... We found out more about what happened and what was going on and what Wanda was doing. Possibly slightly disappointing that the last episode was a generic sort of colourful characters firing power bolts at each other. But um, all in all, a very inventive and imaginative series. That was followed up fairly quickly by The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We saw the return of Sam Mackie as The Falcon and Sebastian Stan as The Winter Soldier, uh, Bucky Barnes. Um, and I sort of enjoyed this. I mean, I think this was apparently compromised by um, COVID. But all in all, there was a little bit of unsettled tub thumping and, you know, finger wagging in it, which annoys a lot of people. But all in all, I, I sort of enjoyed it. It, it, it. There was some good action set pieces in it. Um, and I think all in all, I, I did enjoy it. Uh, that was followed by season one of Loki, uh, which I was disappointed by. I hoped, I expected good things of that. Tom Hiddleston is great as Loki, but I think turning him into a anti-hero didn't work for me. Uh, and of course, one of the criticisms that a lot of people make is that Marvel are emasculating men and trying too hard to box tick and be diverse, which I don't really take, I have little time for because there's no reason they shouldn't do these things. Sometimes it's sort of very unsubtle. And I think Loki was fairly unsettled. And you had, you had, I think her name was Sylvie, who was a female incarnation of Loki, who was um, superior to the male Loki. And I think there's there's an element in culture of that sort of thing at the moment. There is a, like a, a, the classic battle of the sexes is, is, has never been more strongly fought than it is at the moment. Uh, and I think that causes a lot of um, distrust amongst people because they're very wary of projects that seem to be... Um, downgrading one or the other and I think at the moment the scales are sort of instead of being balanced they dip slightly 
Uh, but that's a whole other thing. But I, I didn't enjoy Loki from a story point of view. And this is where we went into the whole multiverse thing. And um, it just lost me a bit because it's it just distances you from whatever reality the MCU generally has. Then we have the first animated series, What If Season 1. I quite enjoyed this. This was eight or nine animated episodes based on various characters in the MCU, many of them voiced by the original actors. It was the, the last voice work we had from Chadwick Boseman. Benedict Cumberbatch came back to play Doctor Strange. Um, a lot of the big hitters, I mean, Iron Man and Captain America were voiced by different people. But a lot of the others came back to voice the characters, and I think a lot of them worked very well, particularly the Doctor Strange one, which sort of had sort of connections to... Um, Multiverse of Madness. But that was quite of enjoyable. Animation's a bit if it and miss with me. I'm not a massive animation fan these days, which is odd because I used to love cartoons when I was a kid. But I don't really buy into them much now. But it was there were some good episodes in there. Then we had what is my favourite, in fact, of the live action series. I know a lot of people criticise it, but I really enjoyed Hawkeye. It was great to see Jeremy Renner back. This was the most like a Marvel film, possibly because it had one of the original Avengers. Um, but it it just had that feel about it. It was funny. You had uh, Haley Steinfeld as Kate Bishop, the the new Hawkeye. Uh, the dynamic between her and Jeremy Renner was great. It was just good to see him back. The final episode was brilliant. There was two great action sequences. There's a car chase in episode two, I'm thinking, and the huge battle at um, Thirty Rock Plaza in the final episode was just worthy of a feature film. That's one of the things I will say about the TV series. They do have some really cinematic action scenes. I mean, Miss Marvel, in particular, I'll come to shortly, had an incredible one in episode four. But I really enjoyed Hawkeye. It had that nice balance between lightness and drama, which is the very best of Marvel. It wasn't too funny, and it wasn't heavily dramatic, but it was a really good story. Of course, we got the return of Wilson Fisk, Kingpin, played by Vincent Donofrio in the last couple of episodes. And, of course, you had Vera Farmiga as Kate Bishop's mother, and you can't go far wrong with something with Vera Farmiga in it. Uh, and duly and fairly criticised by a lot of critics. I thought Hawkeye was a lot of fun, and I would probably say it's slightly better than One Division for me because it is traditional Marvel in the short-form uh, format. Uh, more recently, we've had Moon Knight. Again, this was a, a misfire for me. Started off quite interestingly, but uh, it just lost me in this sort of metaphysical mystical mumbo jumbo about dual personalities and i understand that there are issues about mental health disorder which this addressed which a lot of people would appreciate it but it didn't work for me as a story in fact it didn't work for me as a story to the extent i didn't bother watching the last episode because i didn't care about the story wasn't really into the story i'd actually follow the story i couldn't you know i could really get into it uh, oscar isaac um, gave an interesting performance as uh his name's Stephen Grant, is it? Who's got this dual personality with Moon Knight? But I just felt I didn't care. Um, more recently, we've just had Miss Ms. Marvel. Um, I did enjoy this. I mean, as, as I've said a couple of times about this, I did feel as if watching it, my name should be on a register because it's about like a 16-year-old kid, Muslim girl in New York and her family dynamics and all her little friends and how she discovers she has superpowers when she gets this bracelet thing. Um, I, I did feel like a show aimed at a hyperactive teen audience in, in its style, certainly in the first and last episodes. But it was decent entertainment. You know, I, I thought it was quite interesting. Again, episode four, there's a scene in Karachi, the streets of Karachi, although it wasn't actually filmed there. There's chase scene, which is as good as anything you'll see in any of the feature films. Um, really well directed and kinetic. And a very likeable performance from the young lady who played... Uh, Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel herself, uh, who's clearly going to become a, an important figure in the MCU. And again, I can see why a lot of the uh, older Marvel fans might feel a bit left out by having this character who's a Muslim girl, 16, as a superhero. Um, people often talk about identification figures. Personally, I don't watch something to identify with the lead characters. I watch something to enjoy it. I've never, I don't think I've ever watched a film or a TV thing and think, I wish I was that person. I want to be like James Bond, I want to be like Doctor Who. I know I'm not like these people and I enjoy watching them in action. So I've never really understood this thing about people identifying with characters. But I think that's a very modern, you know, touchy-feely 21st century thing and a way to sort of justify certain things. Um, young women should be able to identify with this. Young boys should identify with that. Um, just watch the bloody thing and enjoy it and stop worrying about imagining that you were these characters. 
anyway, uh, so we've got a couple more things coming. We've got She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, coming up next week on Disney+. Plus. Um, again, it's a fairly obscure Marvel character. Trailers look good, to be fair. We've got the return of Mark Ruffalo as a version of the Hulk. Um, the Hulk is an odd one because Marvel don't seem to be very interested in doing anything with the Hulk Hulk. But they've got this character who is sort of Professor Hulk, who is a humanised version of the Hulk, uh, voiced by Mark Ruffalo with motion capture. Um, I agree with the people who say I want the Beast Hulk back, I want the monster, uncontrollable Hulk back, rather than this rather tame version. Uh, but She-Hulk looks interesting. Um, again, there's, there are those who will say, oh, it's you know Marvel pandering by having a female character. But she is a character from the comic book, so they're just they're just picking and choosing from Marvel itself. Uh, and then we have towards the end of the year, um, we have a Werewolf by Night Halloween special. I'm looking forward to this. Um, stars Gail, is it Gail, Gasha Bernal. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I only found that out this week. Werewolf by Night was one of those tame horror comics that Marvel brought out in the 70s with things like uh, Tomb of Dracula. They, that was when horror became palatable to younger audiences with the relaxing of the comics code. They could do horror. And uh, Werewolf by Night was a, a series I remember reading a lot back in the 70s when I used to collect Marvel comics. There were a couple of issues in particular which I thought were really good stories. And I'm interested that they're doing this Halloween special and I, I can't imagine it's going to be sort of in your face horror but it should be an interesting sort of chiller and it's a nice it's a nice character to, to bring into the MCU and I've heard a few rumours about it which I won't repeat here in case you haven't heard those rumours but it does sound like it's going to be a lot of fun and with some nice connections to other obscure corners of Marvel and then we've got the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special coming out of Christmas which is a precursor to the third film out next year uh, I think it's an hour-long special. And it'll be, you know, I like the Guardians characters. It'll be nice to see them again. So that's phase four sort of wrapped up. And, uh, yeah, I, it's hard to disagree that it's been slightly scrappy. Not everything's been successful. But that's because there's been a lot more of it. It's not that, um, it's not like the earlier phases. As I said, we had three or four films leading somewhere. This has been a bit, you know, Random, bit hit and miss, a bit to throw enough mud at the wall and see what sticks. I don't think there's anything wrong with having a phase that is a bit like that. But I think as long as you appreciate that that's what it is, appreciate that it isn't building to one big climax, it's just telling different stories. I don't see any reason why you can't say, well, I like that story, I didn't like that story. So, you know, I think in the first phases of Marvel, I mean, I wasn't a man, massive fan of Iron Man 2 wasn't first on Captain Marvel. So not all the films and things in the first three phases were as good as people might think they were. And I think it's much the same with phase four. There's been some great stuff, there's been some good stuff, and there's been some poor stuff. And that's sort of batting average that you should really expect from any creative uh, endeavour, really. Let's move on then to what phase five promises us. Um, and it's a lot of stuff. It's a bit less, actually. It's five films and seven TV series. Um, we've got coming up in February a film I'm very much looking forward to Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania now, I'm a massive fan of Ant-Man I'm a big fan of the smallest character um, I like the underdog sort of thing and I think because the Ant-Man films they did very well the first film took something like 550,000 the second one took 550 million the second one took I think 650 million so I'm, it's not surprising that they've greenlit a third film Ant-Man's just been seen as one of the lesser Marvel characters not just in his stature but he's not one of the big hitter characters. But, you know, he's been around quite a bit. We've seen him in um, Endgame. We've seen this is his third film. Personally, what I'd like to see with Ant-Man, because he is a lesser character, I'd like to see an Ant-Man TV series. I'd like to see a 10 or 12 episode Ant-Man TV series, but done in the story style of something like the old Batman TV series. That's the thing that gets me about the Marvel films and the Marvel series particularly. Why they can't just have a series which is, individual stories, two different, two episodes uh, with different villains because there's such a rich catalogue of villains in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It would be nice to see a series, something like Ant-Man, which is 10, 12 episodes with a two-part story, then a one-part story, then a two-parter, then a three-parter, then a two-parter, which has different villains because Marvel's full of these great characters and I just think that telling a story over six or ten episodes reduces the options for proper imaginative use of the tools they have available. And um, it's something I'd like to see in another series as has been announced. But that's, you know, that's not happening with Ant-Man as far as I know. This is the third film. There are rumours that Ant-Man dies at the end. I don't think that's going to be true. 
uh, because he's too likable a character. I think Paul Rudd enjoys playing him. Where they go after this, because it's the third of the films, and they do tend to sort of do trilogies. But I'm looking forward to seeing Ant-Man again, because they're good, fun, very visually inventive films. Um, the first TV series appears in spring next year, Secret Invasion. I don't know a lot about this, but I know it picks up with Nick Fury, Samuel L. Jackson, and the story of the Kree, Skrull, war type thing. I think that's more or less what it is. We've had that sort of teased earlier on with the uh, the aliens, I think it's the Kree, isn't it? Who um, take on human form. And I think this sort of carries on from that. Again, this is one of the problems. I think Marvel has seeded so many things in earlier films. You've got these post-credit sequences and mid-credit sequences that introduce new characters. By the time they get back to doing them two years later, you've forgotten who they were. It's not like reading a comic book where you pick it up the next issue, the next month. You know, you've got to wait two two years for another film. And I think that sort of slows the momentum down sometimes. But that's Secret Invasion. Uh, May the 5th sees the release of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. James Gunn's third in the trilogy. And as, as he has said, the last time we'll get to see the Guardian, this iteration of the Guardians. Uh, of course, Chris Pratt, Dave Batista, uh, voice of Bradley Cooper, the voice of Vin Diesel... Karen Gillan and um, Gamora, Zoe Saldana. Um, the last time we're going to see these characters. And uh, I wasn't a massive fan of Guardians 2. Loved Guardians 1. Sorry, Guardians of the Galaxy. I must do that. It wasn't all Guardians 1. I loved the first film. The second film was a bit chaotic. Um, so I'm hoping this is a, a nice send-off for these characters because they deserve it. Back to TV then. We've got two series in summer. Echo. Not really very interested in this. This is a series based on the deaf character who appeared in Hawkeye. Um, we remember very little about her. I don't know anything about the character. I don't have any anticipations or expectations. I don't know anything about it. But, you know, maybe okay. We'll wait and see. Then we've got Loki Season 2 coming in the summer. Again, not hugely interested in that. Wasn't a big fan of the first series. Um... If it's more of the same, it'll just be more of the same. Then we have the Marvels coming out in July 2023. This is interesting because this is what would have been Captain Marvel 2. But now it's been increased, it's been expanded to include Miss Marvel from the TV series and uh, Monica Rambeau's character from way back in WandaVision. So it's going to be like a two year gap since we've seen her. Um, don't know. Wasn't a fan of Captain Marvel. I think the problem with Captain Marvel is she's Marvel's Superman. Too powerful. There's nothing she can't do. It's in, it's difficult these days to make an interesting story about that sort of character. Um, I've read in the last week or so that test screenings haven't been brilliant, so there may be some reshoots, which are fairly common for Marvel anyway. Um, again, we'll see. It's an unknown quantity. I don't know. Um, interestingly, in November of next year, we've got Blade, Marvel's version of Blade. Now, of course, some could say that uh, Wesley Snipes' is Blade back in 1998 sort of kick-started the exploitation of the Marvel brand. Um, the first Blade film uh, is superb, the second is popular, but not. I wasn't a massive fan, and the third is a train wreck. Uh, of course, it's now being recast with Mahershala Ali, who's a fantastic actor, playing Blade. Uh, but I, I can't imagine it's going to have that sort of visceral sensibility that the originals had. They were adult horror films. This is going to be a Marvel family-friendly horror film. I think Doctor Strange probably showed that Marvel can do a bit of horror, but whether they'll go as far as you might want them to with uh, Blade remains to be seen. But that's coming out November next year. Uh, autumn next year, we've got a series called Ironheart. I, again, I know very little about this, but it seems to be sort of a uh, some sort of female Iron Man. I, I don't know enough about it to really comment, so I can't say whether I'm um, interested in it or not. I am sort of interested in, in winter next year. We've got Agatha, Coven of Chaos, um, previously titled Agatha, House of Harkness. This is the character who turned out to be one of the villains of um, WandaVision. Agatha Harkness, played brilliantly by Catherine Hahn. She brought a real sort of comedy, um, quite threatening sort of comedy vibe to WandaVision. And she was so sort of popular with the audience that she's got her own series. Um... Do we need that series? Don't know. Probably not. Uh, but I'll watch it, of course, because I did like the character, I like the performance, and it'll be interesting to see what they do. Um, interesting, then, spring 2024, we've got Daredevil. He's back. 
played by Charlie Cox in a series called Born Again, 18 episodes. Now, Charlie Cox, his version of Daredevil, was the great triumph of the Netflix Marvel license series a few years ago. And um, we knew he was coming back because we saw his appearance in the Spider-Man film. He's a part of um, She-Hulk, apparently. I think he turns up somewhere else. Um, so I'm glad he's getting his own series again. And it's a big, chunky run, 18 episodes, which I suspect will be spread across two nine-episode blocks. This is what the, ha tends to happen with a lot of longer episode series. Um, again, as I said with Ant-Man, what I'd like to see with this is a run of different stories with different villains. I, uh, I hope they don't just have Kingpin um, all the way through it because I, I just want to see Daredevil battling somebody else. Um, but that's going to be a nice run of episodes, so I'm hoping that they'll chop and change things a little bit. And then in May 2024, we've got Captain America, New World Order, which will see um, Sam Wilson, played by Anthony Mackie, who we saw in Falcon and Winter Soldier, adapt the mantle of the new Captain America after initially reluctantly luck, being reluctant to do so. He's now the new Captain America, and this is his first appearance. Now, that'll be interesting. Um, Anthony Mack is great, he's a lovely blogger I actually met him a few years ago, lovely man really, really friendly um, whether he is a big enough name to carry a big superhero film I don't know I just don't know, uh, Captain America is Steve Rogers and it's, I know the comics have played with that a little bit but Steve Rogers is Captain America and it'll be interesting to see how, how that transition works out then in July 2026 we've got Thunderbolts I don't know anything about this other than the fact I think it's Marvel's Suicide Squad. Again, we've seen, and again, it's been teased in films you've probably forgotten about. Um, Julia Dreyfus from Seinfeld. I can't remember the name of the character. She seems to have been recruiting people for her own purposes, possibly to create like an anti-Avengers team. And I think that's what that's all about. Um, we saw her recruiting the new Captain America guy in uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I think it's her who pitted... Um, Natasha's sister against Hawkeye in the Hawkeye series. Uh, so I think she seems to be gathering together her own group of characters. And I think that's what Thunderbolt is, but don't quote me on that. Uh, there's also another film, February 2024, an untitled Marvel movie. We don't know what that is. Um, fans are sort of apparently hoping this might be Deadpool 3 because we know that's been sort of rumoured as well. So that's what's to come in Phase 5. Phase 6 has a couple of titles. Uh, November... 2024 we've got marvel's take on fantastic four which has been long rumored and then may 2025 we've got the fifth avengers film the kang dynasty and the sixth avengers film coming out in november of that year secret wars so it'll be interesting to have two avengers films coming in one year don't know who the avengers are going to be in those films i'm not going to do a big list of 20 names of what characters it could be i'll leave that to others to do so that's where we are the state of play with marvel how we've been with phase four what phase five and Bit of phase six are promising so what do i think about it all um well one i'm hoping i live long enough to see this stuff uh i do feel i have to say i agree with a lot of the criticisms of phase four with that sort of understanding that it, it doesn't have to be a direction it doesn't have to be an end point you can just throw out different things and i think that possibly leads to the sense of unease and dissatisfaction how people have this they're used to these things building and building and this doesn't seem to have been, apart from the multiverse concept bubbling away in the background. It's just been individual stories of individual characters. And that's fine. But as I said, it, there's been a hit-miss ratio. Um, more hits than misses, I would say. Um, a lot of the stuff I could watch again. Some I would never want to watch again. And with Moon Knight 1, I didn't even finish. However, I do think there is a risk of Marvel overfeeding their golden goose to the point of they kill it. Um, they overfeed it. Um, yeah, as people have said, that you know, looking back at things like westerns and science fiction is cyclical. These things have their time. They have phases, not just the Marvel's phases. So tastes change. Whether people are tiring of Marvel films, I don't know. I was looking at a YouTube thing just this morning, which was a rant basically. Um, pointing out the box office of Marvel films is dropping. Yeah, not strictly true. They were pointing at things like Black Widow, Shang-Chi and Eternals, all of which came out just at the tail end of the pandemic when people were a bit wary about going back to the cinema. So yeah, their box office numbers were deflated because people weren't yet rushing back to the cinemas. But Spider-Man, No Way Home was massive. 
Um, Doctor Strange the Multiverse of Madness nearly made a billion worldwide. Uh, Thor Love and Thunder is going to make around three quarters of a billion. Uh, not as much as the one before, which hopefully will encourage Marvel to course correct the character if he does come back. Um, so the, the, the recent films have all done very well. So I don't think it's fair to say that people aren't going to see these films because they clearly are. I think perhaps they're overcompensating slightly for not having their big hitters by reaching for all sorts of different characters and spin-offs of things. Uh, and I understand it, yes, I suppose it is, isn't easy for casual fans to follow everything. I mean, one of the points I think was made about Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, you needed to have seen Wanda to understand fully what Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness was all about. And I think it was explained... Um, enough in the script that if you hadn't seen WandaVision you could understand that obviously Wanda had gone to the dark side and why she'd gone to the dark side but yeah I think that um, the longer this goes on um, the more there's going to be a sense of uh, people getting tired of it because there's a lot of it and I think that's the problem is that there has been too much of it I think looking back over the last 18 months as I said we've had seven films and 10 TV series it's too much and it takes away the sense of occasion, particularly when you've got the TV series, you think, oh, it's another Marvel thing. And then when that finishes, there's another film. And I think it takes away the sense of occasion in a new film when you're bouncing off a TV series into a film. Um, Marvel films, certainly in the early phases, were like tentpole things throughout the year. Oh, it's a Marvel film, four films coming out this year, three films. But now the gap is film, filled with all these TV series. And I, I wouldn't want to have not seen WandaVision, um, Hawkeye, those two in particular. Um, but I, it's difficult because Disney want to make money. They're there to make money and Marvel is a money-making machine at the moment. Whether people are at some point going to go, that's enough now, I've had, I've had enough. So I don't think, it'll be interesting. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what Phase 5 brings in terms of box office, certainly for the films they've got coming up. Um, beyond all that, of course, I wonder what's happening with Spider-Man. There's no sign of any new Spider-Man film coming up in the next three years. Again, that may be dependent on any deal that Marvel can make with Sony. There's no sign of a Doctor Strange 3. I know Benedict Cumberbatch has said he's played the character a lot in the last couple of years and he wants to have a little break, which is fair enough. But of course, the last film ends on a cliffhanger leading into another film. So I would hope we'd see him at some point. Yeah, whether he's going to be one of the Avengers... Um, I don't know. There's no sign of another Thor film. Now, if you've seen Love and Thunder, it does say Thor will return. So clearly Marvel will want to bring him back. I would imagine Chris Hemsworth would be happy to come back. However, he may only be happy to come back if Taita Waititi is involved. And uh, I'm not sure I could cope with another one of his comedy romps through the life of Thor Odinson. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's not there. There's a lot of stuff that's, um, yeah, that a lot of... There's a lot of gaps in Phase 6. There may well be more stuff squeezed into Phase 5. But I think the broader picture is that I think Marvel probably need to be careful about oversaturating the market. And there is a risk of that because not all of the stuff that we've had is essential. Not all of the stuff that's coming is essential. I have very little interest in Echo or Ironheart or Thunderbolts, mainly because I don't know much about them. They may turn out to be unmissable, but at the moment they, they're just names on a page. Um... So anyway, that's where I am with Marvel. I'm a big Marvel fan and I've enjoyed most of the stuff they've done. Looking forward to most of the stuff they've got coming. I'll always go and see their stuff because it is the modern mythology. And um, I just like those characters. I like that universe. I like the interconnectedness of it. Um, but like any massive creative endeavour, it's not always going to hit the spot. It's not always going to hit the bullseye. There are going to be misses. There have been misses. There will be more misses. I just, um, the worry is that they they will just, you know, spurt out so much content that people will just back away and say, well, had enough now. But we shall see. Only time will tell. Right. Thank you for watching this rather long video. I do hope it's kept your attention. If you've watched it and enjoyed it, um, why not leave a comment down below? Let me know what you think about the way Marvel is going. Um, if you could phrase it in an intelligent way, it would be much appreciated. I don't want any of the nonsense that you see on YouTube. Um, we'll have a bit of a discussion going about Marvel and the way it's going and some of your favourites from Phase 4 what you're looking forward to coming up so like and subscribe leave a comment down below I'll see you soon until I do though keep taking the stuff